got an arc of Harrow, which was one of the most surprising things to happen at the end of 2019. As if getting our hands on Gideon wasn't surprising enough. Right? Gideon was everything that we wanted it to be and more. A romp with lesbian necromancers and a gothic space mansion that was also a locked room mystery. It sounds like it should be impossible, but somehow Tams and more, she did it. With Gideon gone, how is Haro supposed to go on? How are we supposed to go on? And what is the Emperor, the Necrolord Prime, aka God, actually like? Well, his name is John, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Haro the Ninth starts pretty chaotically, switching between second and third person narrative styles for different parts of the story. There is the third person narrative that recounts what happened in the first house when Haro and her cavalier artist learned how to become lictors. Yes, that's right, Haro's cavalier. Ortis. <laughs> Harrow does not remember Gideon at all. All her memories of the last book are gone, replaced with Ortis and a mysterious rifleman killing members of the house. Then there's the second person narration, aka you did this and you thought that. The second person narration takes over the parts about Harrow's life with the lictors. We're not quite sure who's narrating this part, but whoever it is, it becomes quite disconcerting when you realize that Harrow is seeing a phantom that's not there. This phantom is the woman in the locked tomb. So Haro, the necromancer nun, begins her life in the service of the emperor on the wrong foot. Ianthe is her only ally in a house full of lictors. She has a two-handed sword that makes her want to vomit profusely every time she looks at it. She can't seem to lick her right, aka her healing doesn't work like it's supposed to. She has letters of instruction that she wrote to herself and other people that she does not remember writing. And on top of that, she's having a couple of communication issues with the other lictors. Oh yeah, and the lictor, Ortis, is trying to murder her. Lictor Ortis, not to be confused with dead cavalier Ortis. So Haro is not only dealing with the problems that comes with being a lictor in the service of the emperor trying to kill his enemies and whatnot, she also has to deal with her own unbalanced mind. Haro the Ninth is a strange follow-up to Gideon the Ninth. Gideon the Ninth is a huge genre mashup, but it also is pretty straightforward to follow. Haro is a bit of a puzzle box that takes patience, a sharp eye, and trust to solve. Through it, you get the sense that Muir has got an idea about where she's going with the story, and her unique sense of humor and skill at subverting expectations is always there. Harrow the Ninth is a difficult book to talk about without spoiling, so we're gonna do our best to avoid talking about the plot, which we loved, and stick to the little less spoilerly details that stuck out to us. Like, for instance, new characters who are unsurprisingly not what you'd expect. Of the Emperor's Lictors left living, there are three. Mercy Morn, Augustine, and Ortus. And there's only three because Haro did such a good job of murdering Cytheria in the last book. Mercy Morn and Augustine hate each other, but in a way that you would hate somebody after 10,000 years of living with them, which is a lot of distaste and not a lot of follow through. They're more frenemies than anything else. Mercy Morn can't seem to tell Harrow's age and thinks she's probably 12. Augustine doesn't have much interest in Harrow because since she can't lick her right, she's probably gonna die soon. And the Emperor, who would stereotypically be doom incarnate, brooding and intense, is very much like everybody's dad named John, who insists on bickies and tea, and makes dad jokes much to Haro's distaste. The Lictors and the Emperor all have been together for thousands of years, and have thousands of years of history, and Haro and Ianthe are very much walking into these established relationships as observers. And what they don't know about these centuries that this group has been through is just as interesting as what they do know about them. On the other side of the narratory fence, we get to know Ortis, the Ted Cavalier, who is so annoying to Harrow, but so endearing to the reader that it is absolutely ridiculous. Ortis is obsessed with writing an epic poem about an old ninth cavalier named Matthias Nonius. He writes stanza after stanza about Nonius, whose sword skills cannot be beat. Ortis's poem about Nonius basically participates in shonen anime battles at every encounter. Fights that last days before anyone takes a scratch, asking a super strong opponent their name, ultimate attacks, you name it. But it's all in flowery language akin to a modern Beowulf. And despite the fact that Haro professes that she 
hates Ordis's poetry. She's memorized a shit ton of it. All the new characters are great, but we were so attached to the old ones that it's amazing that they come back in Harrow's recollection of what happened in the first book. Abigail and her husband, Dulcinea, Palamedes even makes it in there. But Iamthe is the standout because she is the only one with Harrow in the present, and Harrow has sworn herself to Ianthe in exchange for a favor. Ianthe also has a giant crush on Harrow, one that Harrow is pretty sure that she doesn't return, but only pretty sure. And Ianthe is still cold and calculating as she was in the first book, but this time we really get a chance to get to know her. But whatever the favor Ianthe is doing for Harrow, it's one that we know nothing about and Harrow doesn't really know about it either. All she knows is that she's written a bunch of letters to herself and she is supposed to follow in case certain events come to pass. So there is a lot going on with old characters and new characters and it keeps you grounded in the story while the plot goes its own crazy way. But the one thing I can say about this book is it does give you answers to the questions that were not answered in Gideon the Ninth. A lot of answers to questions like, who could the undead emperor, the all-powerful god of the universe, be fighting against? Where did Gideon come from? How come Gideon wasn't one of the many dead babies that Harrow's parents used to try and make Harrow? All the questions that have been haunting us for months are in there. And if you stick with the book long enough, you will get to the point where everything starts to make sense. And there are such good answers to the questions. And if you want to know what they were, check out our spoilers review and we will tell you all the juicy juicy reveals. Hair of the Ninth wasn't exactly what we expected as a sequel to Gideon the Ninth, but in some ways it was better because it really kept us on our toes. We're just as excited to get our hands on the third book, Elector the Ninth, as we were about this one. The series deserves to get as many readers as it can, so if you have the chance to read Tower of the Ninth, take it. And despite how much this book throws you off balance, there is a lot going on with the plot and characters, enough to keep you hooked, and the payoff is absolutely worth it. So check out Tower of the Ninth.